Hello, and welcome to Living Well with Liver Disease. My name is Lorraine Steele, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Liver Foundation. We are so excited to share this informative program with you today. We're going to be covering so many topics, achieving a healthy weight, sugar intake, foods to include and to avoid in your diet, managing medications and side effects, and we're going to be sharing uh, the most common liver diseases, including viral hepatitis and fatty liver disease. Before we start our program, I'd like to welcome Kevin Morgan, Area Business Manager for Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. Kevin will say a few words about how Meyer can help families along their journey to liver health. Thank you, Lorraine. And thank you all for supporting the American Liver Foundation. As Lorraine mentioned, I'm Kevin with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. We know that getting the right medication is an important piece of your therapy. So at Meyer Specialty Pharmacy, we work with your doctor's office and your insurance through the prior authorization process to ensure that you can get the specialty medications you need. And we can ship them to you at no cost. Simply ask your doctor to send your prescription to Meyer Specialty Pharmacy, and we'd be happy to help. We also know that diet is an important piece of the puzzle when treating your, uh, your disease. So at Meyer Specialty Pharmacy, uh, we offer direct access to our dietitian nutrition specialist. They have lots of great condition-specific materials, such as what to eat, what not to eat, what to stock up on, and even some great recipes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Let's begin our program. You'll first hear uh, about a few presentations and then we will answer your question. So let's start by welcoming Sandy Austin, a registered nurse and supervisor of clinical services for Myers Specialty Pharmacy. Sandy will walk us through what you need to know about liver disease, medications, and more. Sandy. Thank you, Lorraine. Welcome all. As Lorraine mentioned, I am Sandy Austin, a registered nurse with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. The liver has literally been one of my loves in healthcare. It is an absolute amazing organ. So let's just jump right in and I will start off by telling you some facts about the liver. So the liver is the largest internal organ of the body. This is measured by mass, so it is also a solid organ and the main solid organ of the digestive system. It does weigh about anywhere from three to three and a half pounds or about the weight of a football, the size of the football as well, to give you something to compare it to. What does the liver do? We have discovered it has more than 500 vital functions. Although I can't list them all, of course, here are a few of its main functions. Filters toxins and bacteria out of the blood, regulates blood clotting factors, resists infections by producing immune factors, produces bile to aid in your digestion, regulates cholesterol production, stores vitamins, minerals, and sugars that you need for energy, metabolizes drugs and other substances, and many, many more. So a little fun fact for you. You can actually be a living donor. There is a critical need for patients that need liver transplants. So the liver is actually made up of two main lobes and then segments within. Um, you can see those main lobes in the picture there. You have a right and a left lobe. So what is so amazing about it is that it is the only organ that can actually regenerate itself. It's very fascinating. So let's talk about liver disease in general. So what you should actually know. So about one in 10 people, 30 million people on average, in the United States have some type of liver disease. About five and a half million people have chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. And chronic liver disease and cirrhosis is the 12th leading cause of death. 
and it accounts for about 52,000 deaths annually. What are some of these causes of liver diseases? So we have viral infections, genetics, straight from your family, obesity. We have some toxins like drugs, alcohol, poor diet, and then other diseases that help contribute like diabetes. So here are some common, uh, your most common liver diseases. So the first one we're gonna talk about is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD. So the most common form of liver disease in the United States is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It is caused by excess fat buildup in the liver, not consuming alcohol or not caused by alcohol that is. It affects about 25% of the adults in the United States and about five to 10% of the children, which might surprise you. Most of them have no symptoms, but if they do have any kind of symptoms of fatty liver, they result in like abdominal pain, easy bruising, weight loss, excessive fatigue, jaundice, pale stools, nausea, loss of appetite, and dark urine. Some of the causes of fatty liver disease are obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, diets high in simple carbohydrates and saturated fat. So the treatment for NAFLD or fatty liver disease is the weight loss is one of the main treatments. So you need to lose a little weight by diet modifications and exercise. Unfortunately, there are no drug therapies to actually treat fatty liver disease. And management of your of other medical conditions like diabetes or other liver diseases, hypertension or high blood pressure, and your cholesterol levels will help manage that disease as well. Unfortunately, cardiovascular disease is a side effect of fatty liver disease, and it is the most common cause of death of fatty liver disease. We're gonna talk a little bit about NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So NASH is the inflammatory or progressive form of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, about 30% of people actually develop inflammatory reactions to the fat in the liver. Um, and that inflammation then causes scarring or what we call fibrosis. When in advanced stages or severe enough, it actually results in cirrhosis, and then it can lead to liver failure, liver cancer, and death. So progressive weight gain, type 2 diabetes, people with family history or genetic, genetic predisposition aid to actually getting the inflammatory form of the disease. Treatment is, of course, treating the underlying condition causing the inflammation. So the main treatment is actually weight loss. So they need to lose approximately about like 7% of their baseline weight for the NASH to go away. So unfortunately, there's no FDA approved pharmacological treatment, but your doctor may recommend vitamin E or pioglitazone, depending on your medical circumstances. If you meet other criteria for bariatric surgery, your doctor may, may discuss this with you as well. Of course, close monitoring of your symptoms, lab tests, diagnostic imaging, medications, and procedures. And then of course, you do not want this to advance to cirrhosis as it could lead to liver failure. And then a liver transplant may be an option for you. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about viral hepatitis. So hepatitis is the actual inflammation process on the liver. So most common cause of hepatitis is a virus. The most common types of hepatitis are hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. Vaccines are actually available for hepatitis A and B. Unfortunately, there's not one available for hepatitis C, but there are alternatives to that. For hepatitis B and hepatitis C, you don't have symptoms for years usually until you get to the later stages of the fibrosis. So you need to get tested. Make sure you go to your doctor's office, ask them what your testing options are. Let's talk a little bit about hepatitis A now. 
So hepatitis A is a highly contagious liver virus. The transmission is fecal to oral, so the stool actually contains the virus. So it is an acute or long or short term, I'm sorry, an acute or short term infection. And the symptoms usually last less than two months, which is good since it is so, so short, short term. Rarely hospitalizations occur and rarely an acute liver failure occurs with this. So risk factors are living with an infected person, men who have sex with men, illegal drug use, international travel, especially with poor sanitation, homelessness, occupational exposure, and it's commonly spread by not washing your hands, especially after using the bathroom or changing diapers, and not washing your hands before preparing or eating food. Foods typically eaten raw that came from like sewage contaminated water is some of the main sources of, um, into, of the viral transmission. So make sure you get vaccinated and wash your hands. So please wash those hands. Vaccination for hepatitis A is important for everyone, but especially if you have other liver diseases. So a little bit about hepatitis B. So it is the most common liver infection globally. It is transmitted blood via blood, semen or other bodily fluids from an infected person. And it can actually live outside the body for at least seven days. Average of about 5% of adults who get hepatitis B, the infections become chronic. And unfortunately, 90% of infants who could contract hepatitis B, their infections become chronic. So it's estimated about one to two million people or so in the United States have chronic hepatitis B infection. We do have a vaccination for hepatitis B. So please, it is very important, again, to get vaccinated for everyone, but especially if you have any other liver diseases. So um, hepatitis B is about 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV and can, again, can live outside the body for up to or more than seven days. Unlike HIV, it's about 24 hours. So two thirds of those living with the chronic hepatitis B virus don't even know that they have it. Because remember I said, no symptoms until you get into those latter disease stages, uh, but you can still spread that virus. So and up to 40% of the chronic infections lead to cirrhosis, liver failure and liver cancer, which may lead to death. So of course you wanna save that liver, right? So treatment, antiviral medications, they are available for chronic hepatitis B patients only, not for acute. So if you just first contact, contracted the virus, usually symptom support for acute infections. Ongoing monitoring needed by your healthcare provider, lab work, symptoms, medication side effects, and diagnostic imaging are some of the things that they monitor. Of course, the goal for treatment and with the treatment is to suppress that virus and then also to avoid reactivation to improve survival and quality of life by preventing the disease progression. And so a little bit about hepatitis C. We're going through the ABCs of hepatitis, right? So some facts to know about hepatitis C. It is transmitted through blood to blood contact. It is a little bit more prevalent than hepatitis B and estimated about 50 to 60,000 acute infections are reported a year and 120,000 plus reported chronic infections a year. And it, it is asymptomatic. In other words, no symptoms until you get to those later stages of fibrosis or to cirrhosis usually. So about 50% about of infected people don't know that they even have it. So it can take anywhere from 10 to 20 plus years to develop that extensive liver damage with no symptoms whatsoever. It is actually the leading cause of liver cirrhosis, liver cancer, and liver transplants. Nearly about 50% of the liver transplants are caused from hepatitis C. And about estimated 15,000 deaths annually are caused by hepatitis C. So remember whenever I said a total of 52,000 deaths annually by liver disease alone, 15,000 of those deaths are just caused by this virus.
And fortunately though, we do have a cure for it. Treatments are available and the liver can actually start healing, which is good because we don't have a vaccine for the hepatitis C. So treatment for it is your antiviral medications. They are different than the hepatitis B medications, of course. So for all hepatitis C patients, you can take it whether you're acutely infected or chronically infected. So it is an all oral therapy with hardly little to no side effects, believe it or not. The treatment duration is, is an, you can take it in as little as eight weeks. Some may be a little bit longer depending on the actual disease progression and what type of virus is the hepatitis C that you have. Um, there is no vaccine, of course, um, so to prevent hep C. So even after treatment is, even after you're treated, it is important to avoid getting it again as reinfection can happen. So monitoring needed pre, during, and post-treatment is like lab work, symptoms, medication side effects, diagnostic imaging. And of course, the goal of treatment is to eradicate the actual virus and prevent disease progression progression because it is curable. So a little bit about how you can get hepatitis B and hepatitis C. High risk sexual behaviors, illegal drug use, sharing of needles, inhaling or snorting, sharing of certain personal items that can break the skin, razors, toothbrushes, nail clippers, some things you didn't probably think of prior, incarceration, infected with HIV, if you work or live in a high exposure area, hemodialysis, that's for patients that have kidney failure that have to be hooked to a, a machine to filter the toxins out of their blood and use that machine as their kidney. Um, blood or blood product transfusion. Believe it or not, prior to 1992, they did not test blood for hepatitis C virus. And then tattoos, body piercing. Always use sterile needles whenever you do get a tattoo or you get any kind of piercing, any kind of piercing of the skin, period. You want to be sterile. Um, with tattoos as well, you also want to know if they are using, um, they have the disposable ink. So make sure that you see them open those packages in front of you. Organ transplants, um, mother to baby, and then born between 1945 and 1965, your baby boomers. So over about two thirds of current hepatitis C cases are your baby boomers born between those days. A little fun fact for you about organ transplants, since we do have the cure for hepatitis C, they do allow organ transplant with a hepatitis C positive organ to a person that is not hepatitis C positive because after you get it, you can actually get treated for it and cure that virus and it won't affect you. Well, fun fact for you there. So complications though of the liver disease. So you can have fibrosis or scarring of the liver. All that inflammation of the liver, that's what that leads to is that extensive scarring of the liver. Um, fibrosis progresses to cirrhosis in different stages. So you have stage one, which is some inflammation, but minimal effect on function. Stage two, limited accumulation of scar tissue, but you have normal liver function. Then you have stage three, which is extensive fibrosis and scarring, but you have relatively normal function. You might start seeing some fatigue or so as far as symptoms are concerned here, but then you have stage four, which is substantial, substantial cirrhosis, damaging the liver and impairing vital functions. That cirrhosis can lead to liver failure. failure. So you definitely wanna get control of whatever is causing that liver inflammation and the fibrosis to either cure the disease like hepatitis C or reverse start reversing that damage, like uh, start with the diet and exercise with the fatty liver disease, because treatment can slow, halt, or reverse the actual liver damage in stages one to three. Um, if once you get to cirrhosis, then it can lead to liver failure, which you can get hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, which is fluid within, within the abdominal cavity, abnormal labs, like low platelets, high INR, which is a bleeding time. Esophageal varices are, are um, some examples. 
And that can all lead to liver transplant, cancer, and death. So how can you help? We get tested. So early awareness is key. Ask your provider about your options. You can also become a liver donor. There is information on the American Liver Foundation website to help you out on that. And then of course, help someone in need. Be supportive, a friend to talk to. And take care of your own liver, it's the best way. Thank you very much. Back to you, Lorraine. Thank you, Sandy. I love your dancing liver on some of your slides. How cute. Now let's talk about diet and nutrition with Beth Eggleston, registered dietitian and nutrition education specialist at Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. Hello, everybody. Uh, and everyone can see my screen okay? Wonderful. So glad to hear that. Uh, my name is Beth Eggleston, and I am a registered dietitian with Meyer Specialty Pharmacy. And I'm so glad to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite things, which is food and nutrition. I um, am a dietitian, so these are things that I could talk for hours about, but I'm going to try to keep my, my talk today a little bit shorter and talk about feeding your liver well, especially for those with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, because food and what we take in is going to be a huge part of how we can reverse that condition. So why does a healthy diet matter with um, our liver? Of course, a healthy diet matters for everyone, but nutrition does play a key role in both preventing different types of liver diseases, as well as improving existing liver conditions. And there's a lot of nutritional strategies we can employ. And these are gonna be ways to eat or patterns of eating. And one is my plate. And you can see this graphic up here on the screen. This is the my plate icon. And what you see is about half the plate is covered in fruits and vegetables, a quarter of the plate is covered in grain food, and a quarter of the plate is a protein food. Now in the standard American diet, protein is often the shining star of our meals, but with this particular pattern of eating, fruits and vegetables really do shine through. Another style is the Mediterranean style of eating, where this type of diet encourages fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and it really lowers that amount of processed foods and added sugars in the diet. There's also the DASH diet, which is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, another very plant-based type of diet, really encouraging fruits and vegetables and whole grains, healthy fats, healthy um, protein options, as well as low sodium. And then finally, just a plant-forward style of eating, which emphasizes plant foods, but you aren't strictly limited to them like a vegetarian diet. Meat is present, but it's not the mainstay of the meal. Or you could just do what I try to do in my daily life. Um, I love this quote here by Michael Pollan, who's a food writer. He says, eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. Just a really nice, simple way to think about how one could eat. When it comes to trying to reduce our um, risk or at least these uh, overall side effects of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, what we really wanna do is reduce those risk factors. Some of those things include in improving the diet, drinking little to no alcohol, controlling our blood sugars, triglycerides and cholesterol, getting enough physical activity, and also controlling weight. And a lot of those go hand in hand, but I'm going to talk primarily today about how one can improve the diet to help bring down that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and prevent it from progressing to further stages. First and foremost, one thing that you can do is choose more whole foods. And whole foods are foods that are eaten as close to their natural form as possible. So they have minimal processing or refinement, and they are low in saturated fats, sugars, and sodium. So these are going to be foods like a chicken breast versus chicken nuggets, or an apple versus apple juice, maybe a handful of mixed nuts versus a granola bar. Those are the difference between whole foods and more processed foods. 
You also want to pay attention to nutrient density, which is how much vitamins, minerals, and other types of health promoting components are in foods. So if a food is giving you a lot of vitamins and minerals, that food is going to be a nutrient dense food. Oh, I need to go back to one of my polling questions here. I think we, uh, I, are we doing the polls? I'm just gonna continue on. So when we're talking about fruits and vegetables and whole grains and all of our different healthy foods, we really do want to focus on our plant-based foods and fruits and, oh, here we go. Here's poll number one. Maybe we can go on to poll question number two. But when we consider our fruits and vegetables, we really do want to consider all forms. Here's the good question for you. Which form of fruits and vegetables is the healthiest? Canned, fresh, frozen, or dried? I'd love to see your answers from these polls. There are so many ways that you can consume fruits and vegetables that it really is exciting to, and easy to incorporate fruits and vegetables into your diet. When it comes to fruits and veggies, this is really a trick question because all forms do count and all forms are healthy. So you can have fresh, frozen, canned, dry, hundred percent juice all count in our total intake of fruits and veggies. Most people assume that fresh fruits and veggies are best, but really all forms count. Uh, fresh can be a little cost prohibitive at times, particularly I know I live in Michigan. So in the winter, some types of fruits and vegetables can be a little bit more expensive. So choosing frozen when they're fruits and vegetables are flash frozen at their peak of freshness, you're going to lock in all of those nutrients when they're frozen. So those might be a better choice for out of season fruits and veggies. If you're choosing canned, that canned that's a really wonderful and cost efficient way to get more uh, produce items in your life. If you're using canned vegetables, just make sure to rinse them to get rid of the excess sodium, rinse them in a colander. And if you're choosing canned fruits, um, get fruits that are canned either in 100% fruit juice or in water because then you're going to get rid of a lot of that extra sugar should they be canned in a light or a heavy syrup. Dried also do count on um, dried fruits. You want to look for dried shoots, dried fruits without a lot of added sugars to them. And if you're choosing juices, choose 100% juice. Another really good thing to think about is eating the rainbow. So every different fruit and vegetable have a, has a beautiful, different, bright color. And those colors come from pigments that actually give health benefits to that particular produce item. So if you can choose an array of color, trying to fill your cart with different colors of fruits and vegetables, you know you're going to be getting a lot of different types of vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals, which are disease-fighting plant compounds in those plants. Most Americans, nine out of 10 actually, do not get enough fruits and vegetables. And the recommended amount per the dietary guidelines for someone eating a 2000 calorie per day diet is about two cups of fruit and about two and a half cups of vegetables per day. When it comes to other types of plant foods, whole grains are gonna be another really important topic. Whole grains are when 100% of the original kernel is present in the product. For example, this is a great picture of what a whole grain is. There's the outer bran, and that's where the fiber is going to reside. There's the inner germ, and that's that darker yellow, and that's where the healthy fats are, the B vitamins and proteins. And then there's the starchy white endosperm in the middle. When a product is refined, a refined grain means that that bran on the outside in that earlier picture and that germ on the inside has actually been removed. And then you're just left with that starchy endosperm. That starchy endosperm is what makes white flour. So anytime you use white flour to make pasta, to make crackers, to make bread, you have gotten rid of all of that great fiber and all of those good vitamins and minerals and healthy fat from that refining process. That's why it's so important to eat the whole grain product. I often get asked, what's the difference between whole grain and whole wheat? 
it's kind of like, what's the difference between carrots and vegetables? All carrots are vegetables, but not all vegetables are carrots. And it kind of goes the same way. All whole wheat is whole grain, but not all whole grains are whole wheat. There's tons of types of whole grains out there. There's corn and millet and oats and popcorn and bulgur and buckwheat. I could talk for an hour on whole grains alone, um, but those are just some examples. If you're looking for ways to identify whole grains while you're at the grocery store, one really good way is to look at the ingredient list. If you see whole as the first word on that ingredient list, that's a really good indicator that that particular food product is a whole grain. You can also look for this seal or stamp from the Whole Grain Council that you can see on this slide as well. And that's gonna be another really good example or a really good indicator that that's a whole grain product. If you're looking for a good uh, resource, the Whole Grain Council, it's a website. They have tons of different recipes that incorporate whole grains and a lot of great whole grain information. You can't talk about whole grains and fruits and vegetables without jumping into the fiber pool. And I feel that I am a fiber evangelist. Dietitians just love fiber. And so I hope I can convey my enthusiasm to you about fiber because it is just, it makes the world go round. Um, fiber is only found in plant foods. So here's some fun fiber facts. It adds substantial uh, volume to your diet without adding any calories because your body can't digest it. And it offers a host of health benefits as well. Um, it may help to support weight loss. So if you're trying to lose weight because you've been diagnosed with an NAF or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NASH, this is a really good way by increasing your fiber intake to help with that weight loss process. It can re help to reduce cholesterol and blood sugar and in turn reduce uh, cardiovascular disease and diabetes risk. It also improves digestive health and makes you more regular, and it can reduce certain cancer risks as well, like colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Our best sources of fiber are going to be things like fruits and vegetables, as you've been hearing, um, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and beans. On average though, quite sadly, most people do not get enough fiber, probably because they're not eating enough fruits and vegetables, like I mentioned earlier, but the average person gets about 16 grams a day of fiber when the recommendations is almost double that for most people. For women, it's um, under 50. The recommendation is about 25 to 28 grams per day. For men, 31 to 34. And then that amount goes down a little bit as um, our population ages. So if you're over 51, 22 grams a day for women and 28 grams a day for men. For children, the recommendation is about 14 to 31 grams a day, depending on the child's age. A couple of different ways to get more fiber into your diet, certainly choosing more whole fruits and vegetables. So you're making sure you're getting all of that great skin on the outside as well. Incorporating um, fiber rich foods into your snacks, like snacking on hummus with carrots and celery or um, choosing mixed nuts or um, popcorn actually is a whole grain, but you wanna choose a lighter, lower fat popcorn. You can also choose whole wheat bread, pita, crackers, tortillas, the sky's your limit on whole wheat products. And then it's going to be really important to start slowly. So if your body's not very used to eating much fiber, start slowly and make sure you're drinking water um, as you go along because you don't want to get into any GI distress. When it comes to protein, it's going to be very important to choose healthy protein options. We don't want to overload our uh, livers with protein because our, our liver really does have to work to, um, to metabolize it. But some healthy sources of protein include fish and shellfish, particularly um, the ones that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But you wanna aim for about two servings of fish or shellfish per week. Poultry, particularly white meat poultry, is gonna be a really um, good source of healthy protein. Eggs are going to be a good source, including the entire egg. A lot of people will throw out the egg yolk because they're concerned about the cholesterol. However, the, it is the saturated fat that actually brings up your dietary or your, excuse me, your body's cholesterol level more so than dietary cholesterol that you're eating. Low fat dairy is going to be another good source of protein as well as on um, plant-based proteins. And what I really like about plant-based proteins, and if you don't know this about me already, 
it has fiber as well as protein. So you can certainly um, you can certainly choose legumes, nuts, seeds, beans, soy foods to make sure you're getting, you're meeting your fiber needs, or excuse me, your protein needs. When it comes to red meat, it will be important to limit red meat um, consumption less than two times a week is recommended, as well as limiting your processed meat consumption as well. So things like hot dogs and bratwurst and cold cuts, those you do want to limit because of their high um, sources of saturated fat as well as sodium. And we'll talk about those items as well. When it comes to types of fat, um, they are not all created equal for sure. There are two types that I'm gonna cover first that we want to limit or avoid in our diet. And the first is saturated fat. Saturated fat, I like to call our four-legged fat because they come from four-legged animals as well as their products. So it's gonna be things like beef and pork, um, as well as butter, ice cream, full fat dairy products, those types of things that come from cows. I don't wanna downgrade cows because I love me a good cow, but uh, their products may not be the healthiest for us with their saturated fat. Other sources of saturated fat include tropical oils. So these are gonna be things like palm oil, palm kernel oil. And I know I get a lot of flack for this, but coconut oil too is very high in saturated fat. And until I see a robust, study, peer reviewed, all the good stuff. I'm not going to be recommending coconut oil to anyone over another type of oil like olive oil. Another type of fat that we may want to avoid in our diet is trans fats. And luckily trans fats um, come most often from partially hydrogenated oil. And in 2018, partially hydrogenated oils were taken off the generally recognized as safe list. So food manufacturers had to start phasing those types of oils and this type of fat out of the food supply. So luckily, I think we will see a decrease in trans fats over time just because it is being taken out of our food supply, but it is naturally found in some animal products too. Now let's move on to our great and healthy types of fats. First of all, there's monounsaturated fats, and those are gonna be things like olives, olive oil, um, avocados, nuts, and nut butters. And these are really, really great because they do help to lower our LDL or lousy cholesterol and do help to prevent um, cardiovascular disease. And really the shining star of our fats are going to be our omega-3 fatty acids. And you are gonna find these in our smash fish. So these are gonna, this is gonna be salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring smash fish. Um, these are gonna be our, the fish richest in omega-3 fatty acids. Other forms of, or ways, places you can find omega-3 fatty acids would be in things like walnuts, fish oil, flaxseed, chia seed, flaxseed oil, other really good sources. You Another really good way to determine if something is um, uh, high in saturated fat, I'm going back to saturated fat for a moment, is if it's a uh, solid at room temperature. While our unsaturated mono and uh, omega-3s are going to be liquid at room temperature. So that's another really good way to think about it. So one big thing that we can do in helping to reduce our saturated fat amount is to look at the food label. We really want to make sure we are getting less than 20% or excuse me, less than 20 grams of saturated fat in a day. And this is based on the dietary guidelines um, for saturated fat. We want to get less than 10% of our calories from the, this type of fat. And the American Heart Association actually has stricter guidelines. They recommend getting less than 7% of your calories from saturated fat, which equates to about 15 grams of saturated fat per day. Um, we could also replace our saturated fats with monounsaturated fats. So one easy swap could be replacing that butter with olive oil, replacing um, a serving of beef per week with a serving of fish. Easy things that you can do at home. And then some different ways for reducing our saturated fat, easily by reducing portion sizes, cross-checking uh, food labels, low, choosing lower fat forms of uh, dairy products or lower uh, fat cuts in meat, and then trying to cook with oils that are higher in monounsaturated fats, like our olive oils instead of butter or lard or coconut oil. Now let's talk about sugar. I mean, we are innately 
love, we have an innate love of sugar as humans. However, sugar is not going to be very good for our livers, unfortunately. The average American eats about seven teaspoons of sugar, 17, excuse me, teaspoons of sugar every day. And that is crazy. And I'm sure this week with Halloween coming up on Monday, that's going to go up and up and up. But I did want to talk about sugar because of the unique role it plays with the liver. I'm going to do a little bit of a biochemistry lesson um, with sugar. And we have this great poll question. What is the number one source of added sugars in the American diet? Frozen treats, sugar sweetened beverages, desserts, or breakfast cereals and bars. I'll let you guys answer that question while I talk about this biochemistry with sugar. So table sugar is called sucrose. Anything that ends in the suffix O-S-E is going to be um, a sugar. So sucrose is broken down into glucose and fructose, and glucose is the main energy source of the body. However, fructose needs to be converted to that energy or glucose in the liver. And we, when we don't burn up or use all that energy, that fructose that has then been turned to glucose actually gets turned into fat. So eating a high sugar diet can lead to excess sugar stored in the liver, which is converted to fat. And that's how that non-alcoholic fat liver disease can get started. So I asked my polling question. Oh, you guys did great on it. If you can, I can see here, 78% said that uh, sugar sweetened beverages were the top um, source of, a, of sugar in the American diet. So I'm so glad to see that. I'm going to close that out. You guys are rock stars and move on to our next slide where it shows that our top sources of sugar in the diet, 24% of our added sugars come from sugar sweetened beverages. In fact, a 20 ounce bottle has about 16 teaspoons of added sugar in, a, uh, of added sugars in it. 19% of our added sugars come from desserts and sweets, 11% from coffee drinks, 9% from candy, and 7% from breakfast, cereals, and bars. When it comes to teaspoons versus grams, I know I think about things in teaspoons and tablespoons and cups. It's hard for me to convert to grams, and this is what I do for a living. So if you are interested, if you take the grams of sugar on a food label and divide it by four, it'll give you the number of teaspoons of sugar in that food product. So use that as a guide and kind of a visual as you're looking at food labels. And when it comes to sugar recommendations, two different uh, overarching bodies help to provide recommendations. There's the Dietary Guidelines for Americans as well as the American Hearts Association. I like to use the American Heart Association guidelines, which are a little more stringent, but I think that they're very important. And that is that men should get about nine teaspoons of added sugar per day, and women should get no more than six teaspoons of added sugar per day, which is very, very low if you start looking at these food labels. Children should get less than six teaspoons per day and less than eight ounces of sugary drinks per week. So how can you reduce your sugar intake? Some different ways that we can work do this is be wise about our breakfast choices. So many of our breakfast cereals and yogurts are very, very high in sugar. So look at that food label and try to find um, a cereal or a yogurt with less than 5% of uh, your daily total of added sugar. And then think about the drinks that you're drinking, um, making sure you're drinking seltzers or teas or coffee instead of those sugar sweetened beverages, instead of those energy drinks, sports drinks, lemonades, fruit punches, et cetera. Switch up your sweet tooth snack. If you're usually grabbing cookies or mini muffins or those types of things, one suggestion I have for you is I like to mix a little bit of dried cherries, a little bit of walnuts, and a little bit of dark chocolate chips. And the mixture between the richness of the chocolate chips, the sweetness of the cherries, and the healthy fats in the walnuts really do help to satiate and kind of curb that sweet tooth. Look at the food labels as well. So looking at that added sugar piece, that is a newer addition to the food label and very helpful and try to keep those to a minimum. If you can stick to that nine for men, six for women in the teaspoons range um, from the American Heart recommendations, that's gonna be ideal.
And finally, I'm not, I don't want to take away your ice cream or your cake or your cookies. So I really do suggest just trying to do smaller portions of some of your favorite high sugar foods. Sodium is another piece we want to be aware of, especially when it comes to liver health. And most of our sodium does not come from the salt shaker, but from processed foods. High sodium diets increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and osteoporosis. So we really do want to be cognizant about where our, our sodium is coming from and how much we're getting. The American Heart Association recommends we get less than 2,300 milligrams per day. And if you have high blood pressure, less than 1,500 milligrams per day. So probably many on this call, 1,500 is a really good um, range to shoot for. Different ways to limit your sodium. Easily cut back on processed foods. About 70% of our dietary sodium does come from processed foods and eating out. Also, again, I don't want to take away chips or pizza, but if you could eat smaller portions of that, that's going to be very helpful. Explore other flavors like herbs and spices and citrus when you're cooking at, uh, when you're cooking, just because that can give flavor without adding a lot of sodium. And then finally, cook at home because you are in control of how much salt you're adding to food and you're more likely to eat smaller portions. Speaking of um, smaller portions and drinks and those types of things, let's talk about what beverages are best. Water is always going to be the best source of hydration, but a couple other really good things and what I'm so excited to talk about is my favorite drink, which is coffee. Um, coffee is very good for the liver. So coffee has a lot of fantastic attributes. And one is studies have repeatedly shown that drinking coffee helps to lower the risk of cirrhosis of the liver and it might reduce the risk of developing a common type of liver, liver cancer. And it has positive effects on liver disease and inflammation as well. And when I say coffee, I am talking about regular coffee, not decaf coffee. And of course, I'm gonna be the, the, the dietitian here. Black is best for coffee, but if you do wanna add something, a splash of a low fat dairy uh, dairy milk or perhaps a plant-based milk can be great to add to the coffee to add some flavor, but we do want to skip the sugary um, creamers and uh, sugar in the coffee as well. Tea is another really great um, addition to the diet when it comes to liver disease, particularly green tea. Um, it does have a lot of antioxidants in it and it may help to reduce inflammation as well. We want to make healthy choices, and so I did want to include a couple different examples of what that looks like. So this is a breakfast here. This is based on a 2,000 calorie per day diet. We have really wonderful banana, walnut, overnight oats, coffee, and coffee for breakfast as part of our way to start the day. And then to make healthy choices at lunch, we have a great chicken burrito bowl with all these yummies on it. Uh, black beans, grilled chicken, veggies, sliced avocado. And this is served with iced tea for a grand total of 715 calories for lunch. And then finally, a delicious dinner of oven roasted tilapia and veggies with pasta, a side of oranges, and sparkling water. Um, this is a total of 585 calories. And I don't know about you, but I definitely need some, need some snacks in the day. So I'm not going to go without snacks. I'm going to have some air pop popcorn and some yogurt and peach with peaches as well. And so you can see, you can have a full day of lots of great food and getting all the nutrients you need for a 2000 calorie per day diet. Because Getting to a healthy weight and losing weight is going to be the most effective treatment for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I did want to give a couple suggestions for how one could do that. Build awareness by keeping a food journal. Knowing what you've eaten, how much you've eaten can really help our mindset and know um, how we can move forward. Also step on the scale once a week. I'm not saying you need to step on the scale every day. Our weight naturally fluctuates, but if you can choose a day, always the same day of the week, uh, that can help keep you on track. Keep moving. Physical activity is certainly important. Um, talk about that in just a moment. Drink more water. The rule of thumb is about half your body weight in ounces. So if you weigh 150 pounds, or excuse me, 75 ounces of water or other things like coffee and tea uh, per day. Use a hunger scale. So Start eating when you're about a three, stop eating when you're about a seven on your hunger scale. That can be, that can help with um, emotional eating. If you're eating because you're bored or you're tired, this can help really determine if you're actually hungry. 
Finally, choose whole foods. We talked about that earlier. Plan ahead. You're more likely to choose healthier foods if you do plan ahead. Read food labels. Slow down by eating with your non-dominant hand, putting your foot down between bites or sipping water between bites. Prioritize sleep because that plays a big role in our, in our weight and pay attention to portion sizes as well. Physical activity is going to be very important because even losing three to 5% of your body fat can decrease that fatty buildup in the liver. Aim for 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be a consecutive 30 minutes. It can be three 10 minute segments and you certainly don't need a gym membership. You don't need to be slogging away on the treadmill for 30 minutes every day. It's any type of movement where you get your heart rate up a little bit. Walking, bike riding, hiking, gardening, all of these things count. I want to take a brief second to talk about hepatitis C, um, just because we don't want to leave out our, our, our buddy hepatitis C in our liver talk today. But with this type of condition, you do really want to follow a healthy eating pattern, just like we just talked about. I could talk for hours about eating healthy, so I had to fit it in here. But another thing with hepatitis C, you may want to limit iron consumption. So our high iron foods include things like muscle, or excuse me, um, organ meats, liver, mussels, oysters, beef, sardines, chicken, and turkey. Um, you also don't want to use cast iron pans and pots because some of that uh, iron can leach out of those and get into your body. And then you also want to pay close attention to your salt intake as well. Sticking to that 1500 milligram per day diet of sodium is probably going to um, be beneficial. And then be aware of vitamin C. Vitamin C is fantastic because it does help with so many things. But another benefit of vitamin C, or it can be a detriment in this case, is that it helps absorb iron. So if you're taking mega doses of vitamin C or eating tons of vitamin C rich foods, that may help your body absorb more iron. And if you have an iron overload in some cases, you don't want to get more iron than you already than you already need or have. And finally, I really encourage you all to take the quiz at Think Liver, Think Life to learn more.org, excuse me, about to learn more about your risk factors, whether or not um, you have any type of liver condition. And I really hope you'll take this information you learned today for both a healthier life and a healthier liver. And with that, I will hand it back to Lorraine. Thank you, Beth. My gosh, I, I thought I knew uh, pretty much everything in, in nutrition, and I sure learned a lot. We sure appreciate you, Beth and, and Sandy. My gosh, we're overwhelmed with all the questions that you all have been submitting. And please uh, submit your questions in, in Q&A and not the chat. Uh, I, I see we're getting close to the end of the hour. So I'm gonna jump right into the questions. So I see the one question is nutrition oriented. So directed to Beth, will you address the need to eat, drink in moderation, Beth? I will certainly, like I mentioned earlier, I am not here to be the food police, but it is important because we know how important nutrition is for our liver. So if you have... Um, a food that you know might not be the healthiest for your liver, you are a big fan of chocolate cake or something, eating a small piece of that is going to help to satiate your craving for that cake, but choosing other options and really um, focusing on healthy foods for the majority of the rest of the things you eat is going to be important. I like to follow the 85-15 rule where 85% of the time you're eating healthy, um, nutrient-dense, whole foods, and that 15% I'm choosing some of the things that may not be so healthy for me. Thank you, Beth. And so another question I'm seeing is, can you reverse fatty liver disease? Sandy, maybe you take that question. Sure thing. Um, yes, you can reverse fatty liver disease by moderating uh, your dietary needs. Uh, the the diet you eat. So you want to take in less fat um, and do any kind of diet modifications and to make sure that you maintain a healthy diet with a low fat intake, low sodium intake. Um, and what Beth was talking about earlier on, watching your saturated fats, your trans fats, um, eating your healthier fats, like your olive oils and, and uh, your leaner meats like your chicken and avoid things like beef. Um, that way you can reverse and start healing that liver. So you take away that excess fat 
And then that liver will start to heal and reverse in its um, scarring or fibrosis process, as long as it hasn't gone too far uh, to that cirrhotic stage. Terrific. Sandy, we have another question for you. Are sure. omega, omega 3s helpful when you have fatty liver? Yes, they are. They are very helpful. Um, I know Beth did talk about uh, omega-3 fatty uh, oils there, you know, coming from fish, um, like salmon. I think she used the word smash, right? Yep, and salmon, mackerel, so, yeah. sardines, and herring. Exactly. So yeah, omega-3 is good, not only just for the liver, but whenever you're associating it with fatty liver disease, that will help with the cardiovascular disease as well. So that is a very good, that omega-3 fats are very, very good for you. Terrific. So uh, Beth, is it okay to use artificial sweetener when you have NASH and, and diabetes? I would say yes. You're really trying to avoid that fructose overload for your liver, um, particularly with the relationship between diabetes and NASH that, um, you know, you don't want those crazy high rises in insulin either. That's going to uh, not be beneficial for the whole body, including the liver. So using artificial sweeteners, maybe for your coffee or other types of baking needs is going to be beneficial for somebody with NASH. Okay. And uh, in, let's see, so the question, uh, all right, so something, uh, if the liver is inflamed and swollen, how long does it take to, to heal with weight loss, diet, exercise? Uh, Sandy, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, it does depend on how much inflammation or fibrosin fibrosis, which is scarring of the liver, has actually occurred and the cause of that fibrosis. So you actually want to address the cause. So anything that you can do if the cause is like fatty liver disease, of course, do your diet modifications, weight loss, and that will in turn start uh, reversing that process. Um, if it is occurred from like hepatitis C, you need to cure that virus. So get treated for that virus. Once that virus is at bay, whether it be hepatitis C completely eradicated or hepatitis B in keeping that basically submerged and um, in submission, then that liver can not progress further with those certain types of viruses or if it's cured then actually regress and improve in its health. So you do want to talk to your provider to get all the details on your specific case, of course, and to see exactly how much damage you have and what um, areas you need to target. Okay, my gosh, we're being overwhelmed with questions. We will make sure that we share answers, you know, through all of our resources, but Here's a few more that I think we have time for. Uh, here's actually a question from uh, our autoimmune uh, liver disease uh, uh, community. They, they wondered about uh, uh, ursodiol. I, I, I know it is urso. Um, maybe, uh, Sandy, you can touch on, on weight gain and, and urso. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, there is some weight gain that is caused by the URSO. According to a study that was done by the NIH way back in like 2003 or so, um, there, it is a side effect of the medication. And I know um, increased, uh, anytime that they increase like the, the dosing, a lot of times people will uh, gain weight with that increased dosing as well. Um, but there is, you know, different ways that you can just talk to your doctor about uh, ways that you can lose weight, of course, follow a healthy diet, um, but it is um, a side effect of that um, urso. It doesn't label it per se on um, all of the literature, but according to a study, um, a lot of people did gain weight um, on it and they do address that. So it is a topic of concern, so. Yes, yeah, so I would just talk to your doctor to see what the best way is for you to manage your um, excess weight gain for that. And Beth, uh, another nutrition question. Um, is there a way to cleanse my liver and flush out the toxins? 
Well, that is the job of the liver itself. Your liver is that, um, plays that role in your body. So I would say, you know, leave your liver alone, let it do the job that it's, um, that it was there to do. Um, and you can have a healthy liver without needing to flush out the toxins. Okay. And, and Beth, uh, let's see, there's a, a question from, from someone who's experiencing hemato chromatosis mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of what kind of diet would be best. Exactly. Yeah. Um, certainly just eating a healthy diet is going to be important, just like what we talked about earlier. Um, it also is going to be important to, if you are having iron overload and something to talk to your doctor about, choosing foods that may not be extremely high in iron, like those organ meats, um, beef, mussels, oysters, those types of things, and then also paying attention to vitamin C intake as well, so you don't have that extra absorption of iron. I think with that, that might have to be our last question today, Lorraine, um, it being 301. I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. And we'll make sure at the American Liver Foundation, we, we address your, your questions in one way or the other. So we've reached the end of our time together. And if you have more questions, visit our helpline, 1-800-GO-LIVER. And our website is liverfoundation.org. And, and our wonderful friends at Myers at uh, Specialty Pharm Pharmacy have all kinds of great resources for you as well. So, so we really thank you for spending your time with us today. And uh, have a healthy liver. <laughs>